Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for a little education. Today's subject focuses on dogs with disabilities. Our presenter is Dr. Adam Christman, who is the Chief Veterinary Officer at Fetch DVM 360, the number one medical multimedia company in the country. He has pivoted from full-time practicing veterinarian to part-time in both shelter medicine and emergency medicine. He received his DVM degree from Iowa State University, the College of Medical Vet Veterinary Medical Medicine, and his MBA from Aspen University. Dr. Chrisman is uh, the program adjunct professor and course coordinator of the veterinary assistant program at his local college. He has co-authored a book entitled, Honey, Have You Squeezed the Dachshund? A Pet Owner's Guide to Dealing with Dogs with Disabilities. He is a huge fitness enthusiasm and has a great love of his fur babies, those four dachshunds, Chelsea, Connor, Carl, and Clark W. Griswold. He believes every person deserves to experience the love of the human animal bond. We welcome Dr. Chrisman. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the introduction. Every time I still hear my fur babies' names, it just puts a smile on my face. And I hope it does with you out there as well, because you know, giving them a, a lovely name of whatever it is, it just shows how much you just love them. And the human animal bond is just incredible, no matter what disability they may have, what color they look like, how big they are, whatever it is. And so I'm here today to kind of show you a little bit and peel back the curtain of some things that maybe you have heard of, but maybe to educate you a little bit more on what it's like with some of these animals that have some disabilities. And I'm gonna share a personal story with you with one of my uh, fur kids too. And hopefully this will educate you guys as well. And if you have any questions, just feel free to reach out to us because we love to um, love to see them here. So. Let's talk a little bit about resilience. I mean, if this was you or me, and you know, we lost a limb or a leg, it would be, obviously, it's life-changing for any animal or any species for that matter. But you know, when you look at it from the animal's perspective, everyone, it's just incredible. I mean, they really, really bounce back. I think we anthropomorphize ourselves so much because you know, we tend to think of ourselves like, how is this going to affect the human animal bond? And yes, you're not, you're, you're right. There, there are going to be some changes to that human animal bond. There might be some extra care associated with, but you know what? They still love you. They absolutely love you regardless. And every decision that we make, both medical and emotional, is all done out of love. And so when you see these guys that you see in front of you that are here, I mean, look at how happy they are. I mean, yes, they have overcome some significant challenges in their life but they're still looking for food. They got the head tilt going on. They know nothing else but to enjoy the everyday things that a dog with four legs should enjoy, and they rightfully do. And look at these guys that are blind too. Maybe they have lost one eye, maybe they have lost two eyes, maybe they have full-blown cataracts. And age is certainly not a disease, everyone, but it's certainly part of adapting and realizing that my fur baby is getting old, Yes, maybe they're gonna lose their sight. Maybe they're gonna lose their hearing. Some life altering circumstances can happen as you see in front of you where this poor girl, she not only is paralyzed from having a back surgery, but she also lost her eye from glaucoma. And so, but look at the eyes, the spirit is still there. Yes, there's some changes that we're gonna talk about shortly, but you know, their will, their ability to survive is alive and well. Uh, this dog on the right, unfortunately, was giving up to the shelter because their pet parents thought that seeing a blind dog was going to work. And, you know, that dog in the shelter, that dog that you see on the right was probably there not more than an hour before phone calls were made. And within uh, about an hour that that fur baby went to a beautiful home and learned to adapt well with it. So, you know, these guys can really be resilient. So let's talk about some of the reasons on why they can have some of these disabilities. Like what, what happens to them? So let's first talk about reasons for limb loss. I mean, it's not just, they just aren't born. Some actually are born with a, a leg that's lost, but it's just generally speaking, they have all their legs intact, but there could be reasons that we have to do some sort, sort of procedure or life altering event. This could be anywhere from trauma, for instance. So God forbid a dog gets hit by a car. This happened to one of my cases named Rusty and Rusty was only two years young. 
he got hit by a car and he suffered a horrific neuropathy. So in other words, he didn't have the ability to feel anything in his right thoracic limb. And so what he started to do, we first thought that maybe it would come back because there was a neurologic component to it. But unfortunately, he started chewing at his own leg because it was in the way, it was annoying. So we went ahead and I did a front right leg amputation on it. And Rusty lived until he was 14 years of age. So, you know, he had 12 years of living life of a, as a three-legged animal. And the picture that you see in the bottom right there too, that's a shepherd mixed with the right pelvic limb of a stifle amputation. And these guys can unfortunately suffer things such as sepsis, which, sepsis, which is known as a bacterial infection. And if it travels to certain legs or other areas of the body, certain things need to be removed in order to help salvage what's left. Cancer is a big thing, you guys. Cancer is a big thing, unfortunately. Osteosarcoma, also known as bone cancer, we see these in the medium to giant breed dogs. So this can range from anywhere from a Great Dane to Great Pyrenees, for instance. And so, you know, they may be hit with this diagnosis earlier on in their lifetime. Maybe we could see it as early as two to three years of age, but it's not the end of the road either. It's not the end of the road. It may require obviously a limb amputation because these cancer cells can spread to other organs. So by removing the limb, you increase the median survival time of these guys surviving a good quality of life followed by potentially chemotherapy if it's warranted. So, but these guys do really well with three legs. You know, I always say this to pet parents. I said, I mean, you guys out there know this. If your dogs have had a soft tissue sprain, they jumped off the couch wrong, they landed wrong, they went to chase the Frisbee, they come up yelping, they may have torn their ACL, their cranial cruciate ligament in their back leg, but they compensate. They compensate really well for it. So, you know, I say dogs are three legs with a spare, they're four legs with a spare, because that other leg, the whatever it is, they can compensate really well for it. And, um, you know, there is no different. And our profession is so innovative too. I mean, there are ways in which we can even build devices that you see in this Weimaraner, for instance, that has almost like a makeshift thoracic limb. Um, but making that dis difficult decision as a pet parent, I'm not gonna lie, is not easy. You know, I'm a pet parent, I'm also a veterinarian, and I've been on either side of those, those exam tables and giving that diagnosis of a bone cancer and telling them, what do you mean you have to amputate the leg, Dr. Christman? That's a little radical. Can't we just do anti-inflammatories? And unfortunately, no, you know, we have to go to that measure in order to salvage what's left and the quality of life that will be fine. And so we have to be in a right frame of mindset to tell them he's going to be fine. But let's talk about this because there's our significant emotional decisions that are going to be made. There's going to be crying because you think of it, how is this going to affect my day-to-day -day activity? Like I love walking her, you know, is it going to be different? Yeah, it is going to be a little different, but not impossible. I mean, we live a life in this society where things happen. I mean, you, your family, your friends, you suffer some trauma, things happen, but we learn to adapt and overcome those obstacles. And these fur babies give us that inspiration to keep on going. And if, in all my years of practice, I will say that's one thing that I have learned is that the ability for them to overcome. So how will she or he bounce back from this? and they really do bounce back. Maybe it requires some integrative medicine. Maybe you're talking about acupuncture, um, the underwater treadmill therapy that I'm gonna show you, or um, physical therapy, using an CC loop, uh, anti-inflammatories, nutraceuticals, whatever it is, a multimodal approach, but what, it, it is gonna take them some time. So I tell mom and dad, I need you to understand that we have a little rehabilitation ahead of us. Not impossible, mom and dad, not impossible, but I need you to understand because I need to set that expectation so that way they know when they come out of surgery, they're not gonna be out running like it's no time. They're gonna be feeling okay, a little owie, but not impossible, but in the long term, they're gonna be much better. Let's talk about eye enucleation too. Have you seen or heard of dogs or cats or even horses that have had their eyes removed, one eye or two eyes? Have you ever thought, I wonder why? Like, what's the reasoning behind that? Well, there's some significant reasons that you see in front of you. So one could be trauma. You know, I have seen some crazy stories that you really just could not make this up because, you know, certain things where dogs are running and they go to chase a ball and there's like, um, they go underneath the fence and the barbed wire of the fence or whatever, the metal like hits them in the eye. It's a significant puncture injury. I've seen dogs coming in with their eye hanging out. And then I've seen horrific glaucoma where the pressures are so high that regardless of medication and the ophthalmologist, the best treatment of choice would be to remove the eyes 
and they do incredibly well. And then there's other considerations similar to a leg amputation is cost. You know, these aren't super cheap procedures. We're talking about surgery, pain management, rehabilitation, your time maybe off of work. Maybe you have to take a week off of work so you can do the rehabilitation or stay home with them. Most likely if they're having their eyes removed, they're going to have the cone of shame, the little lampshade around their head. So um, that requires some time. That requires some time. Um, and how is my dog going to look? You know, I mean, not to sound very superficial, but sometimes, you know, people will get judgy. When you first look at this dog that I put on the slide, you probably were like, ooh, you know, where are the eyes? It, it throws you back a little bit too. And, but this is Cooper, and he's a six-year-old Australian cattle dog that was diagnosed with blastomycosis. So he had an infectious um, uh, fungal disease in his eyes that can travel to his eyes. So, um, and you know, Australian cattle dogs, they are a very intelligent breed. So mom and dad elected to have both of his eyes surgically removed because he was young. And um, there are silicone ocular implants that you can have placed in if you wanted to just to kind of give the socket a little bit more of an appearance. Um, they elected not to, you know, cost purposes, but it just gives it more of a, a streamlined look or whatever. But I want to share with you the testimonial from mom about Cooper because this will really resonate with you pet parents out there. She writes in and she says, it was amazing. The dogs got along immediately because she has another one and Cooper soon worked out where everything was, that the water bowl was by the tank stand and how to find it. I watched him one day step off the veranda, turn right, walk towards the tank stand. However, this time he brushed the lemon tree with his right side instead of his left and missed the tank stand. He immediately turned back found his way into the veranda and started the process again, this time finding the water. So after four days, it was obvious that things would work out. Cooper and Bailey continue to get on well together, even enjoying their evening walks with their neighbor's dog. Before Cooper had vision, I would have said he was a happy dog, but Dr. Warren was right. Without his eyes, he was even happier. He was in so much pain with glaucoma. Uh, Cooper in pain and Bailey continue to get along well, and, and much to Bailey's delight, they even worked out how to play with one another. It's wonderful to see them gently growl and chew, chew at each other's neck, first one on the ground and then the other. It's as if Bailey knows that Cooper has a disability as he is not so gentle with the neighbor's dog. We are all continually amazed how Cooper has adapted to his new life and environment. Wow, that hits all the feels, everybody, right? Because, you know, as a pet parent, to know that your dog's gonna be permanently blind is scary. Absolutely scary, rightfully so. It's a solid um, emotion to have. But to hear a testimony realizing that it's going to take a few days, their nose is everything, as I'll soon show you in a moment. But it's they adapt. You don't want to move necessarily like a lot of furniture around. But here are some great tips when you have dogs that suffer with blindness. Now, this can be whether or not they have cataracts that are in their eyes from being diabetic, or it can also be like I just showed you with Cooper, where they had to literally remove their eyes called an enucleation. Voice commands are everything. So getting them in, in charge of the word step or wait or watch or hold on. And it's all about your inflection too, everyone. So if you're like step or wait, watch, hold on, they know that they're in tune because their ears and their nose obviously are super high and more so than ours. And so if you learn to give them some words of command, they will assimilate those with like whether it be food time or um, where the water dish is going to be or it's time to go outside. So noises, I've had pet parents that have used whistles. They kept it around their neck. You can use a clicker. You can even use apps on your iPhone or your smartphone that, to actually give them some noises that will assimilate to certain things, whether it's time for bed, time to go outside, whatever it is. Um, we do caution meeting with other dogs because, you know, these animals do have a disability, just like a human too. If you're blind and you don't know somebody, you want to get to know them first. So this has to be very, very, I can't stress this to you enough because another dog will not know necessarily that these dogs are blind or, or can't see. So they're going to be poking a little bit. Sometimes in order for them to communicate, they might do a little nip because they need to figure each other out. So use caution with this. Here's a fun fact too is fire hazards. Campfires, if you're going out with your dogs or you have you know, a campfire in the backyard or whatever, be mindful of that because the dogs are going to be sniffing. They may not know. They can maybe sense the heat, but they may not know they're, they're close enough. A big thing I've seen, especially in cats, when they have their eyes, when they're blind, are candles. So I would absolutely just say a solid 100% no for the safety of your house, your kids, and family, and fur babies. No candles when you have a blind animal whatsoever, just because you just don't know. Even the wax too, the waxy melts that you have that are out there, 
uh, sometimes they can knock it over if they go into it. And, you know, I've seen this. I had a, one that had a really bad scald from that. So, and just allow patients to adapt to furniture changes. So if you're going to be moving some things, which happens, you know, we get it. But make sure you give them the ability to adapt and do those things as well. So let them bump into it. Let them make the mistake. They'll figure it out. They use their nose. They, knew, they use their nose. They know. Um, lift them up if you want them to be on the couch. So they just need a little assistance. I got to share with you, if you haven't, is to follow Pink Piglet Puppy. I was, I was going to wear his t-shirt too. I have a big hashtag, Pink Piglet Puppy. I'm a huge fan of him. His mom is Melissa, Dr. Melissa Shapiro. She's a veterinarian. As you can tell by his Instagram following, he is a huge hit. He has over 200,000 followers on Instagram. And boy, does his story resonate, especially now with, with what we're talking about today. He is a double uh, dapple, blind, and deaf dachshund. And he was uh, given to Dr. Shapiro because, uh, or she actually found him through some, someone who, someone, that kind of a thing. And she says, oh, I think I can work with him. Now she has a pack, Dr. Shapiro, of dogs that are really impressive. You know, they're wonderful dogs. But she says everything that she has taught him is all through touch. And so, because he can't hear and he can't see. So the nose is everything. So I'm going to show you a video of what she has done and you, I strongly encourage you to check out his inspirational stories, but this is a video just showing some of the, tra the training that she's done with them. So this is Piglet in the Pack, it's always called. Let's see if it works. He's right in the middle there. There he is. So she's calling him in. Watch, here he comes. This is what she does. Amazing, right? Like, amazing. <laughs> he can assimilate. He knew that he was waiting for his turn, that the pack was there. And so um, she provides all these different types of signals. She blows into his nose to give commands to. So she does a little puff puff to let him know when it's time to go outside or do his business. Um, but she is a, a great resource for those of you that are interested in learning more about animals with disabilities too. I can't leave without talking about my son here. So uh, this is Cosmo. And uh, this is, Cosmo is the reason why I am a doxaholic. I say that I'm a DVM and the D stands for Doxin of Veterinary Medicine <laughs> because he started this momentum with me. Um, so, you know, when I was on my neurology rotation in vet school, I felt very much attached to them because you do a lot of rehabilitation with dogs that have long backs, corgis, basset hounds, um, dachshunds. And so when I was first started practicing, um, he came to me as a two years, two years of age. He's a long hair, neutered um, dachshund. And he presented at the time with loss of superficial pain. Now, when you get into the specifics about neurology and timing, and that's a whole nother conversation about, you know, neuro and back dogs. But when he came in, he had a little bit of motor control. In other words, he was able to move his legs a little bit. So his owners, unfortunately, and this is a big thing that I just talked about previously, is cost. They were unable to afford back surgery, the idea of him having an MRI. And we get it, you know, it's not, it's not cheap. And so, cause you're looking about like eight to $12,000, depending on, you know, what needs to be done or whatever. So when he came to me, he was non-ambulatory. Um, and then he was unable to express his um, bladder, unable to urinate on his own because this affects the disc. So he's very painful along the thoracic area and he lost what's called a paniculus response. In other words, if I was to pinch you, you would feel it. But a dog, if you go up their back and you pinch, 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 they'll feel it, they'll feel it, they'll feel it, and then eventually they won't feel it. And so that's where you can try to what we call neurolocalize or trying to identify where the lesion is, where if it's on the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, or sacral region, you can do a little paniculus that gives you an idea of what we got. 
If you look in this picture too below, you see it's uh, cut out a little bit, but there's a band that's there and I use a little bit of vet wrap. And Cosmo did not like having um, a, a wheelchair. He did not like having a car and I, I had him in it. Um, it. It just wasn't for him. Some dogs do, and I say this to all my pet parents, some do, some don't. He was one of those that says, oh, hell to the no, I'm not gonna do it. So um, I created this resistance band. I put a little vet wrap around there and then I use it underneath his abdomen for him to go to on his walks. And I'll show you in a second what that looks like. So Cosmo has intervertebral disc disease. And this is a very common, unfortunate disease that we see in the long uh, back dogs. And the prognosis depends on the cause and the time. So, you know, and we can, you know, debate about this too with, with time and when or not, it, you know, when do you, do you cut them in terms of surgery or do they need medical management? But you know, regardless, Cosmo needed an MRI, which is the gold standard. So he had a hemilaminectomy, it's called, where they removed some of the disc material that was kind of, you know, you think of disc material as a sponge, and some of that material got propelled and pushed up on the spinal cord, so he needed to have that removed. Unfortunately, it was too late because he lost all his pain sensation at the time of surgery. So he became a permanent permanently paralyzed dachshund. And so the most common area that you see is T12 to T13. So what that means is just in the middle, if you look at this dachshund, his head's to the left and tail's to the right, right where his ribs meet, that last rib on the far left, you see all those ribs that are going down? That last rib there is that common area. And you know the neurologists say the same thing too, as if they need um, more ribs to support that area because that's where they, it gets weak in their, in their back. Or, you know, if, you know, the genetics, they should have had another pair of legs really be underneath those legs. So they're usually hospitalized for a few days and then they go right into rehabilitation, right into it. So, and this is what it looks like when a dog is down. I will tell you this, there is nothing worse than seeing your dog paralyzed. There is nothing worse that they wanna go to the bowl, they wanna have a drink of water or they wanna run to give you kisses and they can't. And so, I think this is probably one of the most gut-wrenching things that I see as a veterinarian, as a pet parent. And so there are other reasons that they can go paralyzed. There could be a blood clot, something called the fibrocartilaginous embolism. Tick diseases can do it, trauma, metabolic conditions. And then there's chronic, as they get older, they can also develop things. We see these in German Shepherds, for instance, degenerative myelopathy, and the German Shepherds have that very cool, unique stance. But unfortunately, that breed and some other ones are prone to where their knees can drop, their back legs go out, their hips, and then all of a sudden, they go down for the count, and it's not necessarily treatable, but it's manageable. So there's other reasons for these guys to get that. And degenerative myelopathy um, is, like I said, there's no cure currently, but there's a lot of research that's being done on it, including laser therapy, acupuncture supplements, to help give these guys a really good quality of life. Because, you know, these are tend to be large to giant breed dogs that end up getting DM or degenerative myelopathy. And so they need assistance. So if you have elderly pet parents that are going to have to help them, take that into consideration because the best treatment plan is the one that works for pet parents. So it may be like, yeah, I need you to come in three times a week to do laser therapy. But if I have pet parents that are in their 70s and I'm telling them to drive in with an 85 pound dog three times a week, it's not gonna work. I'm setting them up for a failure. So let's see what works. So the best treatment plan is the one that works for you. Write that down because I highly believe in that and say that all the time. So here are some ways that they can live a comfortable life. Acupuncture, what you see on the top right, Dogs that have degenerative myelopathy, such as the shepherd. And then we also see these in the small breed dogs like the intervertebral disc disease. They have carts. There's caninecart.com. There's like carts, this, I, all different kinds of carts that are going to be custom made. You've got to make sure that the measurements are spot on. It's a big thing to make sure the measurements are good. And then there's hydrotherapy, which is fantastic. So what you see there is a Dalmatian that's recovering from some sort of an injury. And um, it, there's a treadmill that's very, very slow. And what we even do even further is sometimes we'll put, it's, and they're in a tank, we put peanut butter on the glass wall to entice them to keep walking and walking. And because it's a non-invasive type of procedure for them. There are specialists that are in this profession too, you guys, that are board certified and rehabilitation that I can certainly be more than happy to guide you along the way. They provide you with exercises that you can do at home. Something like this, getting PVC pipes and cones, super easy to do. Even on top of that, you could just grab, what I've done is I just use seat cushions. I took the cushions off the couch and I made an obstacle course. The whole idea is for them to get their neurologic balance back so they're able to like go over things. So something like this PVC pipe cones, 
easy. You get that at Home Depot. You know, you do that like a couple times a day at home. You send them back for acupuncture or you do hydrotherapy and you can get their road to recovering really well. The team approach is the best. So establishing a relationship between the veterinary team equals trust to pet parents. So one to two days, one to two months, or permanently set those expectations as us as veterinarians, because you as pet parents are gonna know, how long am I in this for? Like, is this a six week thing? Is this a six month thing? Is this permanent? So setting those expectations, you can easily get, this is a BOSU it's called, or instability balls that you can work on. Um, and you can do these at home. What I used to do too is again, when I had my, my other docs in the blue out of disc, I put her right on the seat cushion and then I moved the cushion a little bit. So it was thrown her off a little bit like that. And what that's doing is it's building her core muscles up. So that way she has greater balance. And you can also do this for dogs that have arthritis or hip issues. You literally could just put them on a, a seat cushion and at, at home physical exercises three to four times a day, feed them at the same time. So you're giving them a positive reward. Um, it always is a great, um, great method that way. So. Some dogs are down for the count. When I was uh, in practice, we've had Great Danes that had a cervical disc paralyzed in all four paraplegic. So we wanna make sure that they don't develop decubital ulcers, they don't get urine scalding, and they don't get bed sores. So you have to change them every four hours. And this is where you need the nursing team, you need the veterinary technicians, you need the rehabilitators to help you with this. Soft bedding to help minimize pressure sores. Carts, harnesses, hoists, slings, like I showed you I did with Cosmo. Massage therapy thermotherapy, cryotherapy, electric stimulation. Listen, everybody, it has come a long way. Even just in the past year, there is so much with integrative medicine that's out there. Passive range of motion exercises are easy. When they're sleeping, act like they're dreaming in their sleep. You ever see your fur baby thinking they're dreaming in their sleep? They're running, running, running. You could do that while they're resting too, just getting range of motion exercises going to help work so they don't develop muscle atrophy and their road to recovery is much better. Expressing a urinary bladder is not easy and it requires time and patience. And I always felt as a veterinarian, as a private practitioner, that it, it's, it's, takes time. And I don't necessarily have the 20 or 30 minute consultation to show them how to express a bladder. So therefore I'm like, why not write a book about it? <laughs> so I did, and I co-authored it with Kristen Leidig Bryant. It's a great book of testimonials of dogs with disabilities throughout the country, but it also talks about supplements and when should I express a bladder, how, and positioning. Um, it's available on Amazon. You're more than welcome to, uh, to have it. I think it's a great read with lots of diagrams and fun graphics that are in there for you. And I just think that helps with, um, takes away the stigma that happens with these guys. Um, one thing I will mention when you have the carts, I want you to take a look at the feet. See the back pelvic legs, you guys? Look at the, the booties that are there. This is a really big thing that I want you to hone in on and take a note or take a picture of that because if any of your friends or family have dogs that have disabilities, getting some sort of a booty because they will get nail wear. They will, nail, and I've seen them be horrifically infected. I mean, here you're worrying about their back legs and then they're developing an infection. So make sure you look into having some sort of a booty temporarily, and those have to be changed frequently because they can get nasty and gunky and gamey in there. So take note of that. But you know, the, the dog on the right, I show you this because look how happy they are. They adapt to having an idea. It feels to, to them as if they're just having a harness on and the ability to go and run and chase the squirrels or the geese or whatever, that's all they care about. And so that just makes it really worthwhile. Here's my baby Cosmo, and this is the reason why I got an in-ground pool. <laughs> I mean, who says that, right? Uh, but I, I'm not kidding. This is literally the reason why I never wanted to get any rum pool. I'm like, ah, I don't think we need one. But then Cosmo came along. I was like, we're going to get a, a, a pool because he needs rehabilitation. <laughs> so that's what we did. And so here he is running. And on my YouTube channel, uh, you can take, head over and take a look at it whenever you like. But there's a video of him doing rehabilitation, underwater treadmill exercises, all that stuff. And they require grooming and lots of TLC and finding a groomer that gets the breed. So, you know, my guys have a great groomer that I know <laughs> that everybody knows here uh, that I love and understanding them is important. So Cosmo's paralyzed. So what happens if like, you know, the groomer was to kind of go away or whatever and, you know, God forbid he falls off the table. She knows that she, he needs a certain cut back there. Um, I, I call them nuggets. I would have to like kind of squeeze some nuggets out of him, poop to make him go. So she would do a nice little like baboon uh, shade back there to make sure that he doesn't get any you know defecation or any matted fur back there so you know uh, one thing i want to make sure to you guys is that make sure that grooming is really addressed and taken care of so 
I'll close with my, my fur babies too. So this is just um, my, my mom and all of us have an Easter Sunday. And so we have an Easter egg hunt in our backyard. And Cosmo's no different, although it looks like I pulled them. They love opening up Easter eggs and they have treats in there too. So that was my. <laughs> oh, he is we got eggs, kid. everybody. So there's my kids. There's Cosmo. Cosmo gets one over here. I mean, Cosmo I dragged him because it's hard trying to uh, get Charlie all of them. Got one. Yay, Charlie. <laughs> so they get little, get little cookies in there. There he is. There's Cosmo. Cosmo got one over there. And they all adapt, and they know Cosmo no different with him. Um, so let me just play my uh, show. So that my my crew, you know, it's just um, you know, it's they they are they don't know any different. They really don't. They they realize like this is Cosmo. This is who he is, and um, they take him in. The pack takes him in. Unbelievable, you know. Here are my contacts. If you have more information, feel free to reach out. DrAdamChristman.com. I have a website. I'm also on Instagram. I'm very active on Instagram. I love me on the gram. I do a lot of Instagram stories of some great cases. I have a YouTube channel called The Dr. Christman Show. And I have a Facebook page too called The Adam Christman Show. And I'd love for you to, to join me on that. And I want to thank uh, Assisi for having me today. I think this was such a great, great topic. And I was just honored to deliver that for you.